Firstly, thank you for having me along here tonight to give a word of testimony. Um, it's actually not the first time I've been in this church. I remember coming down here during the COVID days when you were one of the few churches that had reopened. Um, and I've been following the ministry online now for a number of years. And it's been a real blessing to me. Um, particularly enjoyed the, the, the series on Sunday nights past there just on the the end times and Bible prophecy. So it's been a real blessing and a real privilege to be here tonight. Um, It's great to be saved. It's great to have a testimony and to be able to share my testimony. And my prayer tonight would be that the Lord would bless this time and use it for His glory. Um, And I'd like to just begin this testimony by reading one verse of Scripture and it's found in the book of Revelation. It's Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 20. Revelation 3 and verse 20. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Amen. So, my name's Eddie, and I come from the town of Larne, and I was born into a family that definitely would have had a Christian influence on me. And my mum, she is a Christian lady, and my granny would be a Christian lady, and she would have taught me and my sister in Sunday school, and just different people on both sides of the family growing up would have had a Christian influence influence on me, and some of my earliest memories in life was being sent to First Larne Presbyterian Church, to the Boys Brigade, and to the Sunday School, so I was definitely no stranger to the church growing up. And as I look back at my life, if you had asked me at any time in my life, Eddie, do you believe in God? I would have said yes. I don't come from an atheist background, or some other form of religion. I believed that the God of the Bible was real. I had grew up hearing about this man, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross and rose again for the sins of the world. And I would have believed those things to be true. But the reality is, it was mostly just head knowledge. And I had little to no interest in the things of God or living for him. The Bible talks about there being a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And as I look back at my life, the older I got, the more I just wanted to do things my way, not God's way. And by my early teens, I had left church and all the activities that were going on there, and I'd begun to really explore the world. I went to Lauren Grammar School. And during my school years, most of my interest would have lay in sport. I loved playing rugby and cricket, and I did quite well at those sports. Um, And to be honest, I didn't really have much interest in schoolwork or academics or a career, that kind of thing. But by the end of fifth year, I'd done my GCSEs, and I did okay in them, and decided I was going to leave and begin an apprenticeship in Bombardier. And then also in my late teens, I joined a loyalist flute band in the town of Larne there. Um, I come from quite a traditional Protestant family. My dad, he would be heavily involved in that uh, whole loyalist movement. And, And growing up in Larne, I had a number of friends who were in the band. And I decided that I wanted to join. And then I really embedded myself in that movement. And for 15 years, the whole loyalist scene was a big part of my life. So most of my late teens, early 20s, my focus would have been on sport, on playing my rugby and and my cricket, and then the loyalist band scene, going to parades and everything else associated with that. And with these things, I had begun to really explore the things of the world. I'd started to take a drink. I'd started to go out partying. At the weekends, I was going away on various trips with the the band or the the rugby team. And, And really... I was just filling myself up with the pleasures of this world. I had little to no time or thought 
for the things of God. I might have said a wee prayer here or there if I found myself in a difficult situation, or I might have went along to church at, at Christmas time, or if something was on, but that was really as far as it went for me during those years. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to how sin will, will always take us further than we want it to. And for me, one sin was just leading to another sin, and I was falling deeper and deeper into a place of darkness. Jesus says, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And that was so true for me. I, I was a complete slave to my own sin. And I remember when I got saved, I, I heard a preacher say one time that sin can bring pleasure, but it can never bring happiness. And when we confuse pleasure with happiness, we're open to the seduction of the enemy. And that was me, filling myself with the pleasures of this world, but there was no real happiness, there was no peace, no purpose, no real meaning to life. And then, by around the age of 23, I was in a relationship with a girl, and it was a very worldly relationship, and I found out that she was pregnant and I was going to be a father. And I remember at that time, it came as a bit of a shock, it wasn't, wasn't planned, but I remember saying, you know, I, I believe this child is coming from God, and I sort of said a few prayers at that time, and really felt like those prayers were answered, but that was it. Um, along came my son Bobby. I was thankful to God for him, and it was a real blessing at that time. And then all I can say is that a short time after he was born, something began to, to change inside of me. I, I, I began to feel something at work inside of me. Um, and, I, and I remember initially thinking, what, what's wrong with me here? Am I depressed? Is there something wrong with me? What is this that I am feeling? However, the more I thought about it, I remember, I believe it was just in my house one day, and I says, I think this is God at work. Whatever this is I'm feeling, I, I really believe this is God. And once I came to that conclusion in my mind, I never questioned where it was coming from again, but at the same time, I wasn't really sure what to do with it. I just believed that God was doing something in my life. Now, looking back tonight, I can tell you much clearer what was going on. I was under heavy conviction of sin. I knew the way that I was living my life wasn't right. And God had placed this real desire inside of me to seek after him. But then I went on this journey throughout my mid-twenties where I, I, I really tried to clean myself up a bit. In my mind, I, I was trying to live for God, but at the same time, I was holding on to so much of my sin. I, I was making certain changes during the week, but then I was maybe going out at the weekend, and I was playing my sport and getting drunk afterwards, and just doing things that, that, that I knew was still wrong. And looking back today, the truth is, I wasn't willing to let go of my life and truly seek after God. In my heart, I was kind of half, and I like this idea of Christianity, but it was very much on my terms and how I wanted it to be. And the Bible makes it clear that we cannot serve two masters. You'll either hate one and love the other, or you'll be loyal to one and despise the other. Jesus said himself, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So by my late 20s, the, the, the sin that I was still holding on to was taking me places I didn't want to go. I was finding myself in situations I didn't want to be in. And I still hadn't found that peace or purpose that my soul was craving. And the Bible talks about how God has set eternity in our hearts. And I knew that there was a void, there was an emptiness in my life that I could not fill. The drinking, the partying, the sport, Flute bomb, whatever it may have been, even the efforts that I was making to try and clean myself up a bit, it wasn't working. None of this could satisfy the cravings of my soul. So, by around the age of 30, I decided I need to go to church. This is just the way I was thinking. And, and, and I wanted to go to a church where I didn't know anybody and nobody knew me. It was kind of a, a fresh start, if you will. And, and during those years that God had been working at me. It was a very private, very personal thing for me. I, I, I wouldn't have told anybody about it, and I didn't have anybody mentoring me or, or offering me advice on, on what church to go, to go to. Um, 
So for some reason, I decided I'm going to go to Whitewell Church in Belfast. I had never set foot in Whitewell. I couldn't have told you who the preacher was. I knew nobody that went there, but that's what I wanted. All I really knew of this place, Whitewell, we used to take a, a lodge on Black Saturday and would have prayed it up the shore road there. And I remember looking in and seeing this big church and thinking, that's a big church in there. But that was my only exposure to the place. And then one Sunday night, I remember gathering up my two kids. I had two children by now and saying, come on, we're going to go to church. So off I went to church, and I remember slipping in the back row of Whitewell there, and I, I had never seen anything like this before. People worshiping God, people on fire for God, people were coming up to me and saying, are you saved, son? Are you born again? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior? And despite that wee bit of church that I had as a boy, this language was really unusual to me, and and to be honest, I was a bit uncomfortable with it. I didn't really know what to say or how to react to these people. And at that time, the late pastor, James McConnell, was still preaching in Whitewell. And he was preaching the hard truths of the gospel. He was preaching on sin and repentance. And I remember sitting there and, and actually feeling quite offended by some of the things that he was saying. But looking back today, I'm so thankful for that man and for his ministry because that offense that I was feeling was really necessary at that time. A lot of the time, people don't want to hear about their sin or just how truly wretched we are. We tend to cover up our sin and maybe even see ourselves as good people. But the Bible makes it clear that there's none good, no, not one. Psalm 130 says, If the Lord should mark iniquities, who could stand? And not one of us could. So coming to this realization of my guilty state before God, it was an important truth that I needed to hear at that time. And thankfully, the offense that I was feeling would later turn to shame, guilt, and remorse over my sin. Meanwhile there, in Whitewell, the altar call was going out at the end of every service. And I remember sort of sitting there, I was very uncomfortable, and I wasn't sure, should I put my hand up here? What, what I believe in God, but I think deep down I knew that I wasn't right with him, and it made me uncomfortable. That being said, I was gripped. I knew the thing this man, Pastor McConnell, was saying. I knew what he was saying was true. I could see something different in the people around me, and I just kept coming back week after week. And then I remember one day, Pastor McConnell just said this simple thing. He said, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And I remember leaving that night, and, and, and those words were going around my head, and it sort of haunted me a bit. And I was, what does this mean? And am I, am I putting God first in my life? And of course, the answer was no, that I wasn't. And then, all I could say is, a short time after that, I was out in my car. I believe it was a Sunday afternoon. I was just driving by myself, and, and, and these thoughts just came to my mind. This revelation just came to my mind, and it, it hit me so hard for the first time in my life, I realized that all these years, God had been knocking at the door to my heart, trying to come in. But in my own selfishness and stubbornness and pride and love for sin, I hadn't been willing to, to repent and turn and, and just accept Him as my Lord and Savior. And, and it really broke me at that time. I remember being very emotional and I was just crying and crying as the Lord was dealing with me. And I believe that, that I was so emotional for two reasons. Firstly, God was showing me the, the true condition of my heart, the sinful, wretched man that I am, and showing me how deserving of hell that I was, and just revealing to me my, my desperate need for a Savior. But secondly, He was also showing me just how good God is. All these years of my life, when I was living in rebellion to him and holding on to my sins, he was still there patiently and persistently knocking away at the door to my heart, trying to come in. He had brought me this far in life. He, he had blessed me when I had little to no time for him, and he had never given up on me. And that, that was it. I, I was broken. I was ashamed, and I was desperate. And I remember going home and just getting into my bedroom by myself and crying out to God in prayer. And I just says, God, I'm sorry for all these things that I've been putting before you, for my sins that I've been holding on to, and just my unwillingness to, to, to come to you. And I says, God, I, I believe, Jesus, that you're the Son of God, that you died on that cross for my sins and you rose again 
on the third day. And I just asked God to forgive me, to save me. And I told him that I was now willing to follow him with all my life. There's nothing anymore, God, that I want to put before you. And all I can say is, after that, I I experienced what the Bible calls the new birth. I was born again. It was as if the scales were lifted from my eyes. And, And the Bible talks about taking out that that, that heart of stone and replacing it with a heart of flesh. And that became a reality for me. The things of the world that I had been holding on to, I now had this this hatred for, and I really wanted to distance myself from those things. I, I had a thirst and a desire to go after righteousness. I remember getting baptized there in Whitewell Church and, and I began to pray every day and really crave spending time alone with God in prayer. I started to read my Bible. I had a hunger for the Word of God. There was Bibles lying in my house for years, never opened, but God had given me this desire to read His Word. I used to take my, my, my Bible into work and I'd be out in the toilets just reading it at any opportunity that I got, going to, to Bible studies, church on a Sunday, and just filling myself with the things of God. It was truly amazing what the Lord had done in my life. The Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And I can just testify to the reality of that experience. And it simply came from being willing to repent and turn from that life of sin and accepting Jesus Christ as my own personal Lord and Savior. And that was then. I'm now 35 and I'm just going on with God. As I says earlier, I have two, two wonderful children. My boy Bobby, he's 12. My wee girl Katie, she's nine. And God willing, we have another one on the way here. Um, and, and it's just such a joy watching them growing up in their wee faiths and teaching them the things of God. I've been blessed with a beautiful wife, uh, Rachel, and I've also enrolled myself in a a three-year Bible study diploma there at the Shepherds Academy in Belfast. And since I got saved, I've just had this burning desire to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he can do in your life. So I just try and focus myself every day on following him, exploring the gifts that he's given me, and I'm excited to see what he has for me in the future. And as I bring this testimony to a close, I just want to to close with a few thoughts I have about my own testimony. And I think about a wee song that we sing in church sometimes, and the last verse finishes, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. And I just feel that's what the love of God has done in my life, demanded my soul, my life, and my all. And then I think about a wee Bible verse from Philippians 1 and 6, And it's a real encouragement to me. It's Paul writing, and he says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. I know as I stand here tonight, given my testimony, that I'm a saved man. I have a peace in my heart, a joy, and an assurance that I didn't always have. I'm not a perfect man. I fall into sin. I've let the Lord down more times than I can count. But I know that I belong to a perfect God and I know those sins are forgiven and I know that he who begun this work in me will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. And I'll just end by saying, if you're listening to this testimony tonight and you're not saved, whatever it is that you're putting before God, maybe like me, it's your love for sin, could be the drink, the partying, the drugs, the woman, whatever particular sin it may be or or, Maybe you're afraid of what other people would think. Your workmates, your, 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 your sporting mates. I've played rugby my whole life. I captained Lauren Rugby Club. I was always a lad out there. And I remember when I got saved, going out and telling the boys I was saved. And all the usual banter came. Oh, here comes Father Hunter and all the rest of it. But I believe as, as the years have went on, they've seen what the Lord's done in my life. And some of those lads have actually came to church with me in recent years. Um, and that's been a real blessing. And, and even at times, we, we're afraid of what our family members would think. I remember, uh, I mentioned there, my mom's a Christian lady, but my dad's not a saved man, and he would tell you that himself. And when I get saved, he really struggled with it. He actually went to my best mate's door, and another fella called Eddie, and he said, what's happened to Eddie here? How can we get him back? You know, what's going on here? And, and, and he, really didn't, he, he really didn't know how to approach me after it. 
But as times went on, he, he's actually now started to come along to Larn Mission Hall there with us on a Sunday evening, and we're really praying that he'll get saved soon. So don't let any of these things keep you from coming to Christ. I would just encourage you to get right with God today. If you feel him knocking at your heart the way he was knocking at my heart, let him in. There's nothing in this, this world that's worth dying for and going to hell. Jesus says, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Sometimes I would listen to a wee evangelist on YouTube there and he goes around America and he'll just interview different members of the public and he'll say to them, would you sell your eye for a million pounds? And they'll say, no, no. And would you sell both eyes for 10 million? And they'll say, no, no way. But yet it amazes me just how careless we can be with our souls that will live forever. The Bible makes it clear in the book of Hebrews, it's appointed on to men to die once and after this, the judgment. We'll all stand before God and we'll give an account. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, you'll spend the lost eternity in a place the Bible calls hell. And I know maybe hell's not something that's preached on a lot nowadays. And even when I was growing up as a wee lad, it's not something I really heard much about. But it was hearing the true gospel and the Spirit coming and convicting me of sin and righteousness and judgment to come that brought me to the cross. So I, I would just say, I've, I've experienced both sides to life, life with Jesus and life without Jesus. And I can just testify to the goodness of being saved and following him. Amen.